Teresa Waters, the Congregational Care Pastor here at Palm Coast United Methodist Church. To the family, to Mr. Wyatt's family, children, grandchildren, his beautiful wife who is sitting in the back. Please know that Mr. Wyatt was a committed member here at Palm Coast United Methodist Church, and we will continue to keep the family in prayer. If you need anything, please give us a call. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, God, we gather here together to celebrate, to celebrate the life of Mr. Wyatt. Lord, I pray for his family, his grandchildren, his wife, his children. Pray that you will give them the comfort that they need during this difficult time. Hope this celebration will be one that they shall remember for years to come, celebrating his life. And everyone said, Amen. Let us stand for our opening hymn, Amazing Grace, and then we will have our Old Testament and New Testament readings. Good morning. My name is Andrew. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Brown. I am the grandson of Rupert Wyatt. Um, this morning, I'm going to read a reading from the Old Testament, um, the Second Book of Chronicles, chapter seven, verse ten through fourteen. And on the three and twentieth day of the seventh month, he sent the people away into their tents, glad and merry in heart for the goodness that the Lord had shown unto David and to Solomon, and to Israel, his people. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord, and in his own house he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night, and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, and if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Good morning. 
Um, I'm Alexandria Brown. I am the granddaughter of my grandpa. <laughs> um, and I will be reading uh, from the New Testament, um, from the first book of the Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So I, it's granddaughter and grandson. Thank you very much. At this junction, we will have expressions of love and remembrance. I know his son will speak. Uh, his wife has asked Antonetta to speak on her behalf. She has a small, uh, a short reading. All right, who goes first? <laughs> All right, uh, first of all, thank you all for coming, for celebrating life, it's a wonderful event. Um, I remember, uh, all right, thanks for coming, celebrating the life, it's a wonderful man. Uh, I remember coming to Palm Coast, and I always say we're in um, that Marine hat. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I served um, 26 years in the Marine Corps. And he always supported me in that in endeavor. Uh, hopefully I can get through this. Um, we would be in um, Palm Coast, and he would have that Marine hat on, and people would often think that he's the, the veteran, and they would come up to him and say, oh, are you a veteran? And he would say, no, my son. Um, but I think he served because I did four tours in Iraq. and one in Afghanistan. And anybody who has been in, in combat know that sometimes you'll have like really dark days and just a phone call or a letter from him, especially, especially when he got really into his church, he used to talk to me about the Lord and sometimes sometimes in combat stuff that you experience you can't understand I think sometimes it'll bring clarity to it and I really appreciated the letters the phone calls that I received while I was overseas. I spent 26 years in the, the Marine Corps and I was deployed all the time. And on reflection, one thing I really wished that I had more time to spend with him. Um, <clears throat> the last thing, I, the last memory I had of him really wanting to fish, I visited him in flag the rehab and I asked him permission to take him home. I took him home. His wife gave him some food. She cut his hair and when we were going back he told me to take him to the flag left here and we sat there um, and we just talked and he looked out on the ocean and you know his love for fishing just shone through his eyes and at that time um, I wish I could have stayed there or even put a fishing pole in his hand at that time. But his love, his love, he truly loved fishing. Um, on a lighter side, when I was taking his clothes to uh, the funeral home on Wednesday and I was buffing his shoes, 
His wife said to me, um, she said, why, why are you spending time buffing his shoes? And I said to her, jokingly, um, he's going to be walking with the Lord, so he needs shine, sh um, shine shoes to do that. <laughs> and on, on reflection, after I said that, I know he was really into his faith, and, and I truly, truly believe that's where he is. Thank you. Ms. Pearl is sitting in the back, and Antonetta will come and speak for her. Thank you. On her behalf. Good morning. Um, uh, I am here to read from Mrs. Pearl Ashman, who has not been able to come out today. But before I start, I have to say that um, my husband Bert, Frank, David, and Rupert were always fishing together. And I so appreciated him taking Bertie out of the house for a few hours. Though they, they never always, never always came home with anything, and I always warned him that he had to go catch his dinner. Okay, so this is from Ms. Mrs. Pearl Ashman. Ms. Pearl regrets not being able to attend the celebration of Brother Rupert's life, but she's thankful for the opportunity to share a few memories that remain significant to her. So I'll read as if I'm Ms. Pearl. I was new to Palm Coast and was getting Rupert's help in working in my garden when Pastor Leon Mitchell, driving past, saw us, stopped, and we had a good country people conversation. As members of the same church and disciple class, Rupert was proud to speak of the difference becoming a follower of Christ had made to his life. Sister Lorraine and, my, and himself were part of weekend fellowship at St. Simon's Island. No less was his dedication and enthusiasm as a member of the then shut-in ministry, always giving of his best to whomever he was assigned. Rupert was also a member of the prayer ministry that on specific Sundays would provide services to those who were at the nursing home in Bonnell. On a more personal note, Rupert was careful, thoughtful, and always willing to share of his time if either Miss Pearl or a family member were, need, were in need, whether it was for a doctor's appointment or to ensure that I was safely inside my house after Bible study. During the early dark evenings of the winter months, during the early dark evenings of the winter months, if Rupert and Sister Lorraine traveled down south and shopped at the West Indian market, on their return, I would get a call from Sister Lorraine saying, Miss Pearl, Rupert is bringing something for you. It was village sharing that would bring a smile to my face. So as we celebrate Rupert's life, let us remember that on the journey, an act of kindness, seemingly, seemingly little, can have immeasurable worth for others. New, um, Matthew 25, verse 40 reads, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Thank you, dear Rupert. Rest in peace. Anyone else would like to share at this time? All right, thank you. We will now uh, honor him with the slide presentation, a celebration of his life.
soul so weary when troubles come and my heart burdened be then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me you raise me up so I can stand on mountains you raise me up to walk on stormy seas I am strong when I am on your shoulders you raise me up to can be wonderful celebration. As I was talking with his son as we were uh, preparing his, his uh, service today, his son said there are two things that he loved. He loved helping others, but he also loved fishing. Mm -hmm. And I was, as I was sitting there, I was wondering, is there anyone here who used to go fishing with him? And I kind of... <laughs> Did he love fishing? <laughs> Did he outfish you? Just <laughs> all righty. We'll have our let us stand for this hymn when we all get to heaven. Yes.
may be seated. Good morning. Let us pray. Lord, indeed, we look forward to that day that we celebrate with you and with our loved ones in the heavenly place. But now, Lord, we ask your blessings upon us and a sense of comfort be felt upon the hearts, souls, and minds of the wide family. Consecrate us for this hour as we listen and respond to your preach word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me call your attention to our scriptorial passage for this morning. It comes from a very familiar story of the Bible and passage of scripture. From the gospel according to John, the 11th chapter, verses 34 through 40. It is indeed a passage of scripture that is well known during times of memorial and times of death and grief and sorrow. And so to Sister Lorraine and to the family and friends, our prayers and thoughts are with you. And so let me share this passage of scripture that gives us the context of Jesus and how Jesus indeed shares his own theological disposition concerning death and points out that he indeed is the resurrection of life. Jesus and his disciples are now going to the gravesite of Lazarus in a familiar place called Bethany. And if you have your Bibles and if you look at verse 1 all the way to verse 44, you'll see this story. It's a lengthy story in its entirety, but yet is very important for our spiritual growth and maturity. Verse 34. Where have you put him, he asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. Verse 35. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, couldn't he open the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, a stone was lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already been a smell because he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God. So they removed the stone. And then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And I know that you always hear me because of the crowd standing here. I say this so that they may believe you sent me. And after he had said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out bound hands and feet with linen and with his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. I want to share with you the title of my eulogy for this morning, If You Believe, If You Believe. Look to your neighbor and say the title with me. If You Believe, If You Believe. Lazarus, Mary and Martha were indeed close friends, close buds, associates, those who hung out with Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you love to have that moment? To be that close to the master, to the son of God, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, to have that sense of closeness that he would come into your home, that he would be a frequent guest. Well, Lazarus, Martha and Mary had that moment. In fact, if you look at Lazarus' name, it means God has helped. And if you look in front of you and behind you and around you, indeed, we would have to say that God has helped. We have before us this morning an opportunity to celebrate the life and legacy of God's Son. And I want to call your attention, there's a little marker that was given out as we entered in. And look at that marker now and think of Lazarus' name as it relates to God's help. That marker has a passage of scripture on the back. 
the 121st song, and it reminds us, I will lift my eyes to the hills from whence cometh what? My help. All my help comes from the Lord. I want to share with you, it's not always the people who are out front, not always the people who are on center stage, not always those who preach behind the sacred desk or even sing in the choir. It's those behind the scene that make a significant impact upon the life and ministry of God's church and society. Today we celebrate the life and legacy of Rupert C. Wyatt. We celebrate his life and we come with Lorraine and family members and friends. And we share this moment of grief and sorrow with you. But I want to share with you that indeed I would see this couple on countless of days come when no one was around. In fact, come into the prayer room. And I want all our members who are part of the prayer room ministry to stand. I want you to see them. Those of you who are part of the prayer ministry of Reverend Leon, and please stand at this time. Amen. I want you to give them a hand. It's a blessing. Yes. Thank you. It's important because folks come and they pray not only over our membership, but also pray for the community and pray for the world in this day and time in which we need. We definitely need what? Prayer and more sweet prayers. We thank God for your service. We thank God for your father and the way he carried himself. And he was a part of the prayer ministry. The scripture passages that were read all centered around prayer. The passage that was read by his grandson and then his granddaughter is centered around prayer. And prayer is extremely important. It was so important, you could see Mr. and Mrs. Wyatt going into the prayer room and spending hours in the prayer room praying and lifting up petitions to God. Not as a public demonstration or a public show, but to continue to communicate with God. That's our one-on-one -on -one communication. But in the text, in the text we have Jesus who had learned that his friend, his buddy, his pal, his associate, Lazarus, had died. Jesus Christ, indeed, when he heard the news, you would have assumed, just like we do, he would have dropped everything and immediately gone to see Mary and Martha, to be with them. But look at the text carefully when you go home. You'll see in John's gospel, uh, Lazarus' name, and Lazarus is along the line of Mary and Martha. And you'll read their names in other places of scripture. But here in John's gospel, you'll read about Lazarus. Jesus delayed the moment. You would have really thought that immediately he would have dropped everything just to go see about those two sisters. But look at the text carefully when you go home and you'll notice several citations. It is well stated, number one, that his disciples were encouraging him not to go to Bethany because there was a mob waiting there to kill him. Point number two, also you'll notice several citations. He waited four days. It is well stated in Jewish custom that when a person dies, that person has an opportunity to have a sense of life, to relive, or a sense of resurrection during a three-day period. Jesus waited four days. He waited four days. And these restless disciples who were concerned about Jesus' life, and we could say rightfully so, said, Master, no, don't go. They're waiting to kill you. And Lazarus is dead. Why go now anyway? And Jesus gives reference to that Jewish methodology. And he shares that Lazarus is asleep. And for your sake, I'm glad he is asleep. That you may see the glory 
of God. Well, to make a long story short, they make their journey. And when they make their journey, immediately, Martha, who's always busy, always doing things, immediately Martha sees Jesus from a distance and refers to him as Roboni, teacher, teacher. The teacher is here. But she was disappointed. Have you ever been disappointed with Jesus? Have you ever been frustrated? Have you ever thought that maybe God doesn't hear my prayers? He's not answering according to my way? Have you been there? I've been there. And you can see and hear the disappointment if you go to verse 21. She says to Jesus, as a point of criticism and disappointment, if you would have been here, my brother would have been alive. She was disappointed. She was perplexed. She was disturbed. That sense of grief, and grief is heavy. It takes days. It takes months. It takes years after years to work through grief and to know that God is with us every step of the way. This is a perfect point because indeed Martha is saying to Jesus, if you would have been here, our brother would not have died. And Jesus says to her, show me, show me where they have laid him. And as he's going, you hear another sense of criticism. It's not coming from Martha this time so much, but it's coming from the crowd, those who are part of the crowd. The crowd says, hey, he's given sight to the blind. He's healed the lame. Could not he have saved Lazarus from death? It's easy to be what we call in terminology of the sports world a Monday morning quarterback when you don't have the weight on your shoulders, when you don't have the leadership responsibility and you're not called to lead and to guide. And that's what they were doing to Jesus. If you would have been here, my brother would not have died. If you are the son of God and you can do all these miracles, indeed, Lazarus, your friend, would not have died. Then it comes through Mary. Mary says the same exact words of Martha. If you don't believe that, when you go home, look at verse 21 and verse 32. She says the same exact words. Lord, if you would have been here, our brother would not have died. It was out of their own moments of grief and despair. You look at this passage carefully. Indeed, Jesus was very accurate. Jesus comes along and he waits four days on purpose, making sure the three days of the Jewish custom that one could immediately, when a person dies, he has three days to be restored to death. You can look along the way and see Jesus gives us good theology, good doctrine. It's important even for today. He refers to himself as the resurrection and the life, though he is dead yet. He shall live again. Then you look closely. After verse 32, we get to verse 35. You're talking about grief. You're talking about sorrow. The Bible tells us two words. Doesn't matter what translation you have. Jesus wept. Can't you see the tears coming down his eyes? He is the savior of the world, one who can walk on the water. One who can open the eyes of the blind. One who can heal those who are lame. Jesus wept. This sense of grief was so heavy on him. It reminds me of Elizabeth Cooper Ross who came along and she shares as it relates to grief and how the weight of grief can be on our shoulders. Don't let anyone fool you. And she shares with us that we go through a period, number one, of denial denying that our loved one has died. Then we go through another period, a period of anger, that we're angry 
and we lash out even among family members and friends. And ultimately we lash out against God. If you'd have been here, Lord, if you would have answered my prayers, my father was a faithful prayer warrior. If you would have responded to his needs. Then the next stage, we move from denial, from anger, to bargaining, Lord, just a little bit more time. T-I-M-E, it's important. It's so important, we talked about it on Wednesday night in our Bible study, even as it relates to tears, because King Hezekiah, if you have your Bibles, look at 1 Kings, the 20th chapter, he came along and he was sick. It starts out and shares uh, in the first verse, he was sick. And King Hezekiah was told what I'm going to share with you, and I share it with myself as well. Get your house in order. In other words, get your relationship with God in order. Set things right with God and with other people. King Hezekiah was told this by Isaiah, and King Hezekiah turned towards the wall. He prayed to God. You're talking about a prayer warrior. And before Isaiah had gone out of the home after he shared the words with King Hezekiah, get your house in order. The Bible says God told him to go back. Go back to King Hezekiah and say to King Hezekiah, God has heard your prayers. who will give you 15 more years to live. We do bargain with God. And God answers prayers. And God will answer our prayers by saying, yes, no, no. Or wait, but God will answer our prayers. Well, we move from bargaining stage to what is known as the depression stage. And you look at these two women in the text, they were dealing with depression, with disappointment, discouragement, and they all expressed it by saying, Lord, if you would have been here. Then the final stage is the acceptance stage. And when Jesus says, show where you have laid him, the Bible says, Jesus wept. Isn't it good to know this morning that we don't have a Savior who has no tear glands, who doesn't cry, but he indeed has compassion. How do we know? Look at Hebrews, the fourth chapter. It reminds us that we have a Savior who is willing to come along with us and to cry with us, to walk and talk with us along life's narrow way. Amen. Here is Jesus. Jesus is willing to express his own emotions. Then Jesus says, remove the stone, remove the stone. What stones are holding you, holding me back from worshiping God, from praying to God, from being a prayer warrior, for praying on behalf of other people and the world? He tells them to remove the stone. They're worried about the smell. He's getting ready to perform a great miracle. Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. He had to call his name because it's well stated that if he would have just said come forth, all the dead people would have risen from the grave. But he says, Lazarus, come forth. It's good that God knows us by our name. Even the Bible says he even knows the hair or the hairless of every string of hair on our heads. Amen. He knows us just that intimately. He was familiar with his son. He's seen the work of his son. He's seen the work of his son having patience to go fishing. Sometimes catching fish, sometimes not catching fish. He's seen the work of his son praying and praying and praying. He's seen the failures of his son. He's seen the moments of triumph as well. Because we have a God that we can believe in. 
And he says to you and to me today, if you believe. And I don't know about you, but I can say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. I believe Jesus is coming back again. I believe indeed he will triumph in victory. And so like the hymnologist, I can sing the song. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, that's personal. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. He's yours too, if you believe. In Jesus' name, hallelujah and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. He's worthy to be praised. Won't you stand as we sing our closing hymn, Blessed Assurance. Director will now give us further instructions. Ladies and gentlemen, following the benediction, we will be traveling to Flagler Memorial Gardens uh, for the interment. Um, those persons honored to serve as pallbearers, we ask that you please step into the center aisles. From there, Pastor Kevin and Pastor Teresa will lead us out to the funeral pitch. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, our pallbearers, we ask that you come here. And let us receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with us now and forevermore as we continue to believe. In Christ's name, amen. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Though he is dead, yet shall he live again. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. 